wants to pray for us to begin? I can. Okay. Our dear Father in heaven, Lord, we come before you this Sabbath day. We thank you for the beauty and splendor of this world that you've given us, even though it's sometimes hard to see the way you created it with the modern pitfalls of our selfish nature. Lord, thank you for our bodies and for our health and for how resilient you made us as we learn and come to your son, Jesus Christ, to find healing and restoration and salvation. Father, thank you for the way that you love us and lead us back home. We pray that the love that you've shown us will be so deep in our hearts that we can't help but show it to others in a way that will lead them back to you as well. Thank you for the way you bring people together, the way you cross paths. We thank you for all the different people that we are connecting through, connecting to through these videos. Thank you for the internet and the way that it can reach different people around the world. We pray for all those watching. We pray for the hearts and minds around the world to wake up to your truth and realize the damage and destruction that comes from Satan's deceptions and lies. Father, we are so excited for the soon coming of your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray that there will be more workers in the field. And we pray, Lord, that you will help strengthen us and lead us in your path of individual work and salvation. You have a work for every single person in the world that will turn to you. You have given all of heaven for the work of salvation. It is such it is so big, we can't possibly understand how powerful and important this is. Thank you, Lord, for your love, for never giving up on anyone. Thank you, Jesus, for leaving heaven and coming and giving your life, sacrificing any selfishness that tried to tempt you day after day, and for bearing the weight of every single person's sins in Gethsemane, and for bringing the perfect character of the Lamb to the cross so the whole world could see the true character of God. We pray that the world will study you and come to know you, find healing. All these things we humbly pray in the precious name of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Kim. Thanks. So wants to start with the parable. Yeah. So, yeah, guys, um, I would like the first thing that came to my mind, you know, we are going to talk about each of us sharing our one of our favorite parables that has come to us in our minds. And the first thing that came to my mind when you guys came up with the idea is the rich man and Lazarus, that parable. Mm. Uh I, I find it, there's so much to it and so much depth and I find it to be quite fascinating that people, you know, when I hear many other Christians, they, they take it as literal what's really happening, but this is a par parable. It, it really exposes a lot of their beliefs at that time period. Even nowadays, it can be a parable that exposes what many Christians believe in an eternal hell and really the state of the dead and so to me and in these latter days that is a huge thing is the belief of an eternal hell and the soul being eternal what are your guys's thoughts of lazarus the parable of lazarus um for me i think as far as Jesus bringing Lazarus from death, which probably isn't the same as the parable, but I think there's that point that every single person has to come to, to realize that the parable is really about ourselves because we're all sinners and we're all without Jesus dead. And I think we all have to come to a place to where we come to, um, realize that Jesus is our savior and realize that only he can raise us from the dead. And I feel like 
the journey kind of is retrospect. Like you were raised from the dead and you realize what happened after the journey to get there is a little bit different, but um, coming to realize like for me, like I was dead. I really was. I was spiritually dead and Jesus saved me and raised me from the, from death. And the thing is, is like Jesus is alive in heaven right now. But like, I didn't believe that for the longest time, but since I've come to find the healing and restoration of Jesus Christ, I see it in so many people around me. I see him working and healing people. I see people being brought forth from the death. I see little things happening in people's lives that, you know, can only come from the Holy spirit. And so I just feel like coming to understand that we're all dead and we all need Jesus to be raised from death to avoid the second death. That's kind of what I get from the concept of Lazarus is like, we're all Lazarus. Heath, what are your thoughts of the parable of the Lazarus? The parable of Lazarus and the rich man was aimed at one group of people, the Pharisees. That's the religious people um, of the day. And the religious people of the day believe that um, because they are of the seed of Abraham, that entitled them to heaven. That's why you have in the parable, Abraham in heaven, and then you have the rich man in hell being tormented. Now, this is not literal. This is, this is just a, this is, this is a, um, okay. This parable, it's, 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 one of my least favorite, but, uh, but I'll ex explain why. Um, but this parable is is aimed at, at one group in particular, and it's it's what's in in the in theological circles called, which I've heard this before, and it just when I heard it, I was like, "Whoa, that's amazing!" It's called uh, it's it's ironic uh, uh, satire ironic satire ironic because the um it's and it's an irony because the the end of the story is one that is not expected um it's an ex unexpected end so you wouldn't like the people of of the day of jesus day would never think that a rich person would end up in hell you know because they thought that a rich person was favored by god so that's the irony of the story and a satire, satire is making fun of an of an existing belief, and the, the the so so Jesus is making fun of the belief that Abraham somehow the father Abraham is the one that receives all the good Jewish Jewish people in heaven. You know, notice there's no God in in that heaven. There's no angels. There's none of that. It's just Abraham and his bosom, and that's heaven. Um, so it's a very satirical, it's very, it's it's almost unlike Jesus. It's almost when I learn about this, like that's why I hate this parable so much. Um, anyway, so he's using he's using um the, their own belief against them. Um, and it's, it's that's what's going on in this parable. But the end of the but that doesn't mean that the parable doesn't have a point because the, the the point of the parable is given by Abraham of all of all things is given by him. It says in the in the at the end, towards the end of the parable it says, you know when the when the rich man is begging for to send Lazarus to his brothers, he says they have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them, right. And then the, the the rich man insisted, no, but if somebody were to raise from the dead, they will listen to that. It says, if they don't listen to Moses or the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. That that parable is aimed at one group only, right? The unbelieving Jews. No, there's no, no other group that this really applies to. Uh, so they had the law, they had the prophets. Where it describes, you know, uh, the Christ and and his works. If they don't listen to that, even if a person comes back from the dead, which it happened, mm -hmm. a man named Lazarus did come back from the dead. And uh, so did the Bible says. The Bible says, and this is in the book of John. It says, 
that after Lazarus was resurrected from the dead, the the priest and the and the teachers of the law began to think about killing Lazarus. Imagine mm -hmm. that, right? So, so the 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 murderous thoughts come from well before. So no miracle is going to to change their minds as to who the Christ is. So this parable is very okay. So, and for people listening to this to this to this uh, video right now, if you think that you know, oh yeah, just the Pharisees that doesn't apply to me. That's really really when it talks about you have Moses and the prophets talking about the religious people who know the truth, who know the law and don't do it. So it's not just limited to the Pharisees of the day or just the Jews of the day. You are just as a non-believer if you have the law, right? And you do nothing for the poor. You do nothing for the needy. You do nothing for those who are around you who you could help and and, and minister to. There's Lazarus, is, is, which is the one that, that you know, that represents the, the people who are in need. Um, and I know I'm just as guilty as anyone, you know, when we see a homeless person out on the street and we don't help them, when we have been blessed, richly blessed by our God with material means and we don't share. So it's a, it's a, it's a gut-wrenching parable. Uh, this parable, it's, it's beyond deep. It's, it's hugely it's so many aspects to that parable. It's, you know, I can't even begin to, to do it, but I just want to give the crux of, of, of what is, is going on with that. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a parable that goes, that slaps you in, 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 in the face and is not in a good way. Uh, so, so it's basically a rebuke to, to, um, to really re religiosity um, and piety false piety that is that where if you think that you're just going to church and doing these things but neglect the poor neglect the needy neglect the people around you um that you are somehow going to be all right um you know that's it's a it's a yeah it's it it's a deep parable so <laughs> you know so yeah zach that's a that, that was a it's a tough one for me. yeah <laughs> Well, you know, we know God is love, and absolutely, and and He's a physician. It's it's hard. I mean, imagine a doctor having to sell, tell someone they have cancer. You know what I mean? And that you're gonna die. I see in this parable that Christ is telling such a hardened people, these these Pharisees as well, that are extremely hardened. There's still a chance, and Christ is like, "This is it, man. This is your this is your diagnosis. Like, you are clinging on to these lies, and if you continue to cling on to them, you're gonna die, and you're not. It's gonna be tormenting. You are when when Christ died, and like the Pharisees, it's not like they're like, "Yeah, we won. We finally got him." No, they were anxious. Things were happening, and the Pharisees, they they understood they killed the Son of God. They didn't have comfort and peace for fulfilling their mission and killing the Son of God, their enemy. No, they were more anxious and more fearful, and they were completely in the hands of Satan, and they acted more drastic and foolish and led, like just like the Pharaoh of Egypt, just further into doing foolish things, and uh, it truly didn't give them peace right now. Or not right now. So Christ sharing this parable was like, guys, this is your situation. And even if you don't believe my words that talk about me, there's nothing else that's going to help you, to get you back on track. And not even the resurrection, like you brought up, the, the resurrection of Lazarus or even Christ himself. And who knows how many other people, when Christ died, of those that were resurrected to preach the gospel when the apostles, the disciples, ran away and hid. And so, uh, it's 
was not like you brought up. It's not only applicable to them, it's applicable to us today. And the same thing is going to happen in, in these final moments of Earth's history. I believe that God has is going to work through us to share to to be we're ambassadors of Christ. So we'll be sharing to certain groups of people in our final walk in these latter days. And we're gonna have to tell some heavy truths. And I believe parables are gonna be a big part of it and the, the life of Christ is going to be a big part of it and it's going to be hard and it's going to hurt. Um, and we just pray and hope that people will wake up. I know like being a baby Christian and even before that, man, I had to hit like when you hear the truth, it's like a dagger going into your heart. It hurts so bad. It, it's, it's not fun, but it just shows you the love of God that he's willing to do whatever it takes. Um, even in drastic situations and, and big truths to get you back on track. And I thank God for them because it really woke me up and I needed that. Yeah. So it, it, sometimes you need a little slap to wake you up from your spiritual slumber. And and so, yeah, we, we just, this parable is powerful and we're going to see it happen in these latter days. And, you know. We'll see what happens. Uh, just pray that people accept the truth. Can I say one me. thing? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, you go, you go ahead, Keith. Oh, I, I was going to share something that um, an experience that I had with this barrel with a friend of mine. But if you want to go ahead. Yeah, don't do it. Um, so I had a I had a story. I have a story if I could share with this a story. Um, so I had a, a friend, a non Christian. Um, that I that I took to church, you know, it's it was, uh, it was a Japanese American church, um, and the, uh, the the preacher was pre preached on this parable in Japanese, you know, and I I'm not I'm not joking, like like this this friend of mine, person of mine, loved that sermon so much, right? That that made an impression on her that um, she would want to go for, like like look forward to going again she went back to japan but like she still like speaks of it you know um of, of, of the sermon and then in my mind i'm thinking like of, of all parables <laughs> this guy could pick he picked this one that i i personally don't find uh, uh very comforting but somehow it 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 rang uh you know like something that really helped her um to really um come to Christ. So it's 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 amazing how you know even with you know how different parables hit different people. Um you know I guess me with having too much understanding of this thing, you know, uh of, of this parable. She had like she had no idea. This is probably like her probably well I wouldn't say the first church experience, but probably like probably her first, I would say her first Bible lesson. Um, and it was this parable and it made an impact and it very, made a positive impact. And I will not think that there was anything really, you know, there's not a whole lot positive ha happening here, but somehow, you know, it, it worked out that way. So, uh, so it's very interesting how the spirit moves with different stories in the Bible. That's all. Go ahead, Kim. Okay, so I just have one story that I have to share because the timing of things is interesting. I just had to grab my Bible. So um, what you were talking about, Keith, but one thing, um, that parable, like even someone being raised from death wouldn't change it. And then the actual person that they ended up murdering, taking part in murdering their God, Jesus, uh, was raised from death their work to kill him was undone and it still didn't change so that's interesting but um the point you made keith on you know just loving people and being kind to people this is something in every christian person's journey that we all go through so in my journey you know i've had different experiences like when a Mormon missionary showed up on my doorstep and I know that I'm not going to go back to the Mormon faith, but as a Christian, does that mean that I'm rude to them? You know, like there's this point that happens when you open the door where you want to be like, Oh no, I know more than you. 
you know, like, oh, no, I have the truth. I don't need you. I'm going to be rude and close the door. Like, is that is that the spirit of God acting through us? And so, like, I, I catch myself and slow down and let the Holy Spirit, like, lead me and be like, no, you need to be kind to these people. You need to be kind to everyone, no matter your differences. Right. And then there was a situation where I went and, you know, did a medical missionary work. And I told you guys about it a little bit. And there was I met some people with cancer and they changed my life. Being in a situation with people as they are dying changed my life. It changed my life a lot. It let me see a lot of things of how God works, how he works through people. There's some people that one, several of them have passed away. And then some of one of them, I've one of my friends that has really horrible cancer been praying for for the past year and just seeing how God works through people because he could instantly heal them, you know, but um but it's just interesting going through the journeys, but there was this one woman I met there and she just was volunteering and she's a seventh day Adventist. She was, uh, she's a, the, a black woman. And I got set in this culture that's, you know, there was a lot of, there was Asian black and white. Right. And so it was an <laughs> all, all races. <laughs> yeah. Interesting culture mix. And, um, but this woman, she was, she was very, she was heavier set, like, you know, and you know, a nice woman, but people didn't respect her or treat her very well. And I could see that, you know, and once again, this comes back to Christian things. And um, there was a point when her and this one guy there were arguing back and forth. And I just stepped in and reminded them like, we're all here to grow in the Lord. Anyways, I didn't think much of God crossing my path with this woman at the time. Right. But I've stayed in touch with her, sent her like a holiday card. She texts here or there. And then she got in a car accident like seven months ago and reached out to me because she couldn't find any help and needed a little bit of financial help. And in those moments, it's like, is it my responsibility to help you or not? You know, like those moments where you're thinking through stuff. And I think and I catch myself going into some of my old thoughts before I before Jesus came into my mind and heart. But I was like, OK, you know, I'm not going to tell her no. So if I'm able to help someone and they ask me for help, I'll help them. So I helped her. And then she reached back out to me a little while later and needed, it just fell into like, she got really sick and didn't have anyone to help her and fell and needed, you know, more money than I could help with by any means. And I just pray to God. And so, but anyways, reached out and our church actually stepped in and helped out with our love fund a little bit. And, but I didn't do anything. And then I was reading through Ellen White's notes in Isaiah one night. And it was funny, I was reading through this and it said, give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. And I believe that is Matthew 5, 24, Matthew 5, verse 42. And like when I was sitting and reading that, I just, re I just re it was reminded of her. And so I had a situation to where I was able, I sent her a couple books from Tim Jennings and told her to watch The Power of Love and um, sent her a little bit of money that I was able to help with at that point. And, um, and she sent me back a message this morning just saying that um, she had given up, you know, she had, she's held her faith, but she'd kind of given up on God, not given up on God, but just kind of given up. And um, that she started watching The Power of Love and, you know, like these little things changed. And here's the thing that I came to realize is like people are going through hard times. They don't have they they've had so many people shut down. They don't want to help them. They don't want to show them love. People are so stuck in our own selfishness and taking care of ourselves that we're not helping. Like she's not homeless. She's not destitute. But she has grandchildren that she's taking care of. She doesn't make a lot of money, you know, just like a hard kind of single grandmother type life. And how sad is it that in her own church community, her own community, family community, there's no one that will help her. And God crossed our path in a way to where, you know, like once people come back and ask you a couple times and that one, if someone asks you, turn them not away, but like in not turning them away, in showing her a little bit of love, in giving to her what is already God's that should be shared anyways, it's helping her relationship with God. It's helping me see how God works. And I've probably grown as much from it as she has. And that's the thing is in these little situations, step by step, God sends people into our life and crosses our path and then gives us little things to teach and help us grow. And if we choose to let God 
lead and trust in him, he'll heal both parties and help both parties grow. So I just think that's interesting in this time, especially when the world's growing so dark. How is it that people can be like almost in despair and giving up because no one can show them an ounce of selfless love and sacrifice what they have to help someone else? Like that's, I don't, it's, it's fascinating. And then it makes me wonder like how many, like there's so many people that could just, just a little bit of help can change their life, you know? So anyways, I just had to share that because the timing was too um, interesting not to. Praise God. Thank That's you great. for Thank sharing you. that, Kim. Absolutely. Excuse me. One second. So, uh, Kim, what, what's a parable you'd like to share of Jesus or part of Christ's life? So I really love Christ object lessons where Ellen White goes in and explores the parables. And, um, as much as I study the parables, I still <laughs> just feel like I'm only scratching the surface. And I think my favorite parable of Jesus at this point in my place of understanding is Jesus. Like, I love studying, I think, Christ object lessons. Anyone who wants to better understand Jesus's parables, I think that's a good place to start. Um, but I love that Jesus is every word he says, every ounce of himself, he is a parable. He is the word made flesh like he is the bible lived out um all the parables of the old testament of the tabernacle i believe are pointing to the coming savior and his body the body made from god's hands not from man's hands and the temple the sanctuary message where you know the temple in heaven the <laughs> you know i believe that temple in heaven is jesus the records in his mind, the records in his heart, they're, it's Jesus. And I really, the more and more, um, I'm more and more convinced by this all the time that Jesus is the ultimate parable. He is God in the flesh. He is, um, he is the, the law. The law is in his heart. He is peace. He is the God's government. He is the temple. Like, it all points to Jesus. I think Jesus is the ultimate parable. And I love that it's like an endless ocean that can never be understood. But, um, but yeah, so like, I think that's my big thing. And then just coming to understand through Jesus, the character of God, it's just like an endless study that Jesus is truth. He doesn't, you know, God is truth. And, you know, the more you come to the feet of Jesus, the more you study him, the more you surrender to him, the more the Holy Spirit can give you his character. And you can see changes from who you used to be to who someone, some, someone that's more like him. And, um, and yeah, so I just, I love the parable of the body. I love the parable of Jesus and his body. And I think the more I study, because I was a biology major too, like every organ, every bone, I think that there's, I think that when we go to the millennium with Jesus Christ and understand why God created our bodies the way he did, I just think we're going to be so flabbergasted by the amazingness of everything. And I love that Jesus is our deliverer and the female is the one that, you know, in her womb, life has grown in the womb and delivered through her. Jesus created the world and we are going to be delivered through Jesus. Like I just, Jesus is a parable and everything kind of wraps back into him. And I really love that God teaches in parables and that Jesus kind of is the ultimate parable and God taught through Jesus. So that's the untold, the not the told parable. I think my favorite parable is the lived out parable, which would be Jesus. Amen. Keith, what are your, what's your favorite parable? So my favorite parable, um, there's, there are several, but I, I think the one that, that, that made the most impact, especially when I was, uh, in my early, you know, 
Christian walk was the parable of the workers. And that's the one where, you know, the uh, landlord goes and hires certain workers um, in the morning for a denarii. Now, a denarii, it's actually a day's wages. So in, in some translations, it's for a penny, um, but it's actually a coin that symbolizes a day's wages, you know. So he goes and hires these people. They agree with that. And then throughout the day, he goes out and finds other workers, right? Like, oh, you're not working? Go into my vineyard. And at the end of the day, right, he gives them a day's wages, a denarii, all of them, you know, whether they work for an hour or they work for, and, and in those days, you work for 12 hours, by the way, not eight hours like we do today. That's another thing. <laughs> so so the, the ones who work for, for, for 12 hours, right, complain and said, hey, how come you're giving them the same as we? You, you made them the same as we. And the explanation is given right there in the parable. You know, and he says, you know, um, what is it to you? You agreed, you agreed with me to a day's wages. That's a day's wages, right? You agreed to work for that, right? If what so what if I want to be generous with my money and give the same as you? So what 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 in between the lines, what, what he's saying is that the landowner is actually the landowner is actually robbing himself in terms of like, you know, fairness, you know, because usually when you have an employer, the employer only wants to give you um, as little as possible, first of all, but, but as much as you have worked. So if you work like, say, if you work two hours, eight hours, they pay you for that, right? And no more. But this guy just gave them a whole day as if they had worked the whole day, Um and what does this parable illustrate? It illustrates that the kingdom of God is not a meritocracy. You know, we we don't earn the kingdom of God based on, you know, the amount of work that we do. And this is the idea that, you know, the false idea that many have in Christianity. You know, it's, it's basically, you know, I deserve this because of what I have done. Not because it, it's, it's for the first time, actually this parable is for the first time made me think, that actual work, like the work that we do, whatever it may be, is actually a gift of God himself. Um, we don't think of it in those terms. We think of it, even the, you know, I even cringe at this, but even when you see when your wages, it calls earnings, you know, it's your earnings, you earned it, right? I, I don't see it that way. It's it's a gift. Even Even you have a privilege to work at your job. It comes from God. You know, the fact that the, the the landowner came in and offered work. I used to be a day laborer uh way back in a seemed like a like a lifetime ago. And as a day laborer, you know, your job is to show up early. Like I'm talking about, you need to be standing in line about like 5:30 in the morning when the gate when the when the doors open at six in the morning. For you to find work by seven o'clock all work is done like uh, all work for the day don't even don't even show up at you know at them to show up at seven o'clock or even 7 15 right for work because it's, it's not gonna it's not gonna be there so you won't you won't eat or you won't make any money at, at, at during that day right but what this parable showed is that okay so if it, it talks about hours and the hours in the bible are different but anyway but it basically was saying you know, he show, shows up at nine, he shows up at noon, and then he, sh he shows up the 11th hour, by the way. Do you know what 11th hour is actually in the day? The 11th hour is 5 p.m. 5 p.m. <laughs> There's no, nobody's hiring at that time. And this guy and this landowner is still looking for work. So there, there are many things in that parable is basically saying um, that, God is generous for, first of all, allowing us to be co-laborers with him in, in the work of salvation. That's one. But two, that it is a privilege to work, you know, in or be a part of his work, which he freely offers. Um, and three, it's not too late. Like if you're in the stage of, 
of life that you feel like you're too old to like begin to walk with Christ, it's not too late, clearly, because like, you know, the land order came at the 11th hour, <laughs> like because sundown, sundown is at six, right? And that's, and that's the, the reason. So sunrise is at 6 a.m., sun, sun, sundown is at 6 p.m., right? And that's why the day, the day is, was 12 hours, the, 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 the labor time is 12 hours, is a 12 hour shift. Um, so at, the eleventh hour is five p.m. in the afternoon. So you only have one hour worth of work before before the sun goes down and there's no more work. And basically, Landry is still looking for work for workers. He's still he's still looking for you, you know. So if you're thinking that it's too late, it's not too late. You know, you have breath, um, you have air in your lungs, whatever. You're qualified, you know. And basically, God is looking for you to join Him in His work. Uh, and I thought that Sparrow was was amazing. And and but here's the thing is that he's not taking into account uh the merit. He's not taking into account like you know what it is that they, you could provide. He gives to each one the same the same way. So it's not a meritocracy. Um it's basically all it's it's all of grace. It's a, I I love that parable because it just shows me that you know the the generosity of our heavenly father, of our God that we have in being able to be co-laborers of him, um, to being able to, to, to participate and being basically his hands, his feet, or his representative in some, some small aspect of his work that he shares that with us, which is incredible. When I think about it, it's kind of like, we're so unreliable, you know, I'm unreliable, <laughs> you know, but yeah, uh, he, he's willing to, to share that. And then, um, whatever little bit that we get to contribute to that, he still gives us the same reward. Um, I find it amazing. So if you're listening to this, it's not too late, you know, you can join in the work at this time, even at this late time, you can join in and, um, he will compensate you as if you have been there all along. And the so. that parable too, the the workers that got their wages early and then were jealous that someone came late and got the same benefit. Um reminds me so much of the prodigal son's brother. You know, it's uh -huh. kind of kind of that same spirit. And the thing is is like when we come to understand the joys and relationship of working with God and being his servant, like to choose choosing to serve God, you know, like it is a joy and a privilege. And so it's interesting too how often we think it is our own works. Like, Oh, I worked hard, but it's like, if maybe we're so focused on our works and we don't realize all the privilege and benefit that we've had with God, but I like the generosity of God there too, because he does he doesn't take the take it away from the people that were there at the beginning of the day either, even though they didn't quite get it. Right, right. You know, like they still get the benefit, just but they but they are robbing themselves of the pleasure and privilege that, you know, like and the people who come at the eleventh hour, like they miss all the time growing with God. And that relationship and that building and that service and the character building, because that's what happens when we're working with God is that he is building a, a righteous character in us. And that is the gold, like that is the, the blessing, the gold, the healing, the, the sweet spot, you know? And so I just think too often in all of Christ's stories, we as humans get so focused on our own works that we we mm -hmm. miss that intimacy and relationship with God, and that's the whole point of everything. Amen, and that's and, and that's the privilege that we have. And I think that we, you know, it, it, that parable made me think of work in a diff differently. Not not just not just work. I mean, obviously, work that we that 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 we do for 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 our, our living. It's a gift of God. I mean, that's there's no question about it. Not for me, you know. Um, having been through like different type of work that I did, I, I mean, I was a day laborer, and again, it would be it would be criminal for you to show up late, um, 
you know, for a for a day labor, you're not gonna get any anything, you know. And and talk about like you know the earnings. <laughs> yeah, if if you if you get like you know and work an hour, that's all you're gonna get. You know, you're not gonna get a whole day's work. You know, I mean, so that that's the kind of um, employer or heavenly father we have. He's very generous with us. You know, and and it's just it's just amazing. So. And then, then when it comes to the spiritual work, right, again, it is, it is a, like you said, Kim, it's a privilege to, to be there from the beginning. You know, when these people are thinking in terms of like, oh, look at what I have done, I have done for God. And, and they're not thinking in terms of the privilege that, you know, they have in just being in that position because God allowed them and hired them, you know, for for, for this work. Uh, it's just, it, it, it's a privilege. And I think that in many ways, um, I'm grateful for that, um, for that insight. There's so many people out there who don't know the scriptures. They don't have the, the same hope in Christ that I have, um, you know, and the things, the, the reason why I live my life the way I live is because of the Bible and things that I learned from it, um, which gives me, I feel like a, a, you know, an advantage in terms of the choices that I'm, the life choices that I make, because of the the wisdom that I have received from it. Um, doesn't mean that I'm perfect. Doesn't mean that I do everything right either. But uh, for the most part, there's there there are the principles that are in there are part of what I what I can see where it's a privilege to be able to have it. Um, whereas if if I didn't, if I was in ignorance again, you know, I would not be living my life, you know, in this way. And I don't think I would have the peace that I will have today. Um, so th there is, there's so much into that parable that just shows, you know, how, you know, how privileged we are, even as, as, as humans, you know, to being able to participate um, in the work of God, you know, even here in this, in this, um, in this fallen world. You know, this parable is uh, it's such a hard to swallow truth of the body of Christ. You have these people right. who are in the church for a long period of time, and yet they don't know God. You know what I mean? They they did not see the graciousness of the landowner, his character, mm -hmm. that he is gracious. And they rejected him. They abhorred him. They didn't like him. But yet, those that were at the later hour, they saw that he is gracious, that he is loving. And, he, like, and, and they saw that he is love, and they accepted him. You know, they accepted him into his hearts and were extremely blessed. And, and um, I see that in the, in the in the body of Christ. That's how things are going to happen. And you will have those that, as God reveals more truth in these final moments of Earth's history, there will be those that have been on it for a while. And I know we've had a discussion in a video before with the prodigal uh, son, the prodigal father uh, discussion. And it's people, really, it's yeah, really. yeah, the, the people that have these pastors or evangelical uh, people, these TV evangelists, people that we know, and they seem like really friendly people. They've been at it. And I mean, I can think of people and and you just hope and pray they will accept more light from god and um but you'll see that most will completely reject the true living god and you'll see those who are new at it like like kim you and i and god reveals more light and it's just up to you are you willing to accept that that revelation of god that he is love and that he is willing to do whatever to save you and that he has provided a remedy and so well, I love I love these parables. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think it's important too to remember that when God 
looks on someone, he sees all of them. So he sees where they were, where they are, and where they and where they will be. Whereas when we see somebody, we see where they we see where they are. Sometimes we see where they were. And that's it. We're I think as humans we we forget that we have no introspection to what's going to come and the work that God has been and is continuing to do in everyone to get them where they're going to end up. And that's why it's so important that we always go back to trusting God because he knows the future. He knows what he's working on. He knows he knows this one play that's going to come in and completely change everything for someone. And we don't know that. And in these parables too, they're very condensed and they don't have, you know, even like the story of Abraham, all the Bible stories, it, it tells, it tells uh, pivotal moments. It goes to the, the most pivotal moments, the beginning, a pivotal moment, a pivotal moment and kind of the end. And, um, but it leaves out all the details because otherwise the Bible would be a book that you could never make it through. So I just think it's so important to remember that God is in the business of salvation and um, the dust of the earth and the stars of the heavens. And we don't know who we don't know. We don't know if we're going to be like Peter and deny Jesus in our time of trial or whether, you know, we, we don't know all of the disciples, all those who walked with Jesus, they all, none of them were ready and none of them were truly converted at the time of trial, at the time of Christ's trial. And that is, that is telling for all of us. So no matter how far we've come, I'm very certain that we're all going to look like a bunch of idiots in the trials that are coming and and God is going to help us through it. And then we are going to have this deep conversion and be filled with the Holy Spirit in a way that, that then everything changes. And even is, and like, this is something I find fascinating with the disciples. Like the disciples didn't see, like after Jesus died, they didn't see it. Only the thief on the cross recognized Jesus as being God before he died. And the disciples didn't see it. And then, they all were like sad. Their whole world fell apart. Their faith was broken. Their their savior died. Even though the scriptures foretell stuff, right? Where they they weren't out researching the scriptures. They're all being sad. And then Jesus comes and visits them. And they're like, "Don't you know what happened?" And that's the thing is like. And then he breathed on them, and the Holy Spirit filled them. Right? Like they had to believe that their God, their faith, it had to be completely crushed, and then. Jesus came to them again after he was raised from the dead and he breathed his life into them again throughout the whole story. It's Jesus doing everything like they follow him, they follow him. And then he works to get them through the whole way through. But like they had to have everything that they thought was happening, everything that they believed was going to happen that had to be crushed before they could see what was really happening. And I think we're all there too. We all kind of think we know what's going on, but we really have no clue. And that's why we have to trust in God and know that if we keep following Jesus and we keep going day to day and trusting him, then he'll get us through. But it's gonna be Jesus that comes and gets us through. And I feel like there's going to be that time to where this, this whatever we think is going to happen has to be crushed before we can really see who God is and really see who Jesus is, because that's what happened to the disciples and history repeats itself. And it happened to all of the disciples, even John, like there weren't any of them that were like, Oh, we get it. We get it. They all had to go through that experience. So, so, so Kim, do you think that spending time with God daily with a humble heart and open heart that it will lessen the pain, lessen the blow? Yeah, you're, we're all going to be crushed, but we're all going to shatter as we fall upon the rock. But do you think it will be less painful if you spend more time with God and, and pray and surrender daily? 
Yeah, I think the stronger your connection is, the stronger your faith on God rather than your faith in yourself and your own plan, the 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 better we become at putting our faith in God and learning to trust him. Of course, the closer we're going to be to the Holy Spirit, the stronger we're going to be in God's strength and the more able we'll be able to stand. And we'll, the more, the less we'll be like so shaken because we'll already be knowing to go to God and trusting in him. And what is happening? Lord, send me your spirit. Let me, I'm used to depending on you. It won't be that foreign. Someone who thinks they depend on God, but really they're making their own plans. Like that's going to be a little bit heavier for them, but I think it's going to be heavy for everybody. And I think that only God knows, like, you know, like all of Christ's disciples, they kind of thought like they were with it. They know what's coming. We know that we know, you know, we'll die for you. We'll go, we'll do whatever we need to be with you. Like there's nothing that's going to stand between us, you know? And then they all fled. They all, they, they all fled. Peter actually lied. Like, I don't, and the thing is, is like, God knows, he knows who we are. He knows our weaknesses and how we're going to stand in those moments and how we're not. And Jesus already bore each of our sins individually. So he's already conquered them for us. The strength to conquer our sins is in Jesus Christ. The only way we can overcome them is through Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. The only thing that can hold back the darkness and protect us from Satan and the forces that are coming is the Holy Spirit. That's why we need to be sealed in our forehead. But ultimately, I think we're naive to believe that like, oh, I found the right truth. I found the right church. I'm studying my Bible. I know everything. I'm ready to go. Like that's kind of where the disciples were too. Hey, I found the Messiah. I'm here with Jesus. I'm walking with him every day. I'm ready to go. We're good. Right. You know, and then they had their, their, their idea of how everything was going to happen had to be crushed because it was wrong. Because I think we're so, we're born into this world and we're, our, our, the fabric of the reality we live in is so composed of lies that it has to be, you know, like God's working to cleanse all of it, but it's so ingrained in the very world we live in. There's, I just think that, you know, it's just our human nature to see things from our human nature. Oh, uh, that's, that, well, go ahead, Kim. Sorry. No, I, that's just what I think. I don't know. I think that history is extremely important. And with what happened during the, the pandemic, that whole situation, I really think we should, every one of us, review what happened and how did we take it? How did we react? Um, I know with my own personal experience, and I thank God that happened because i you know when i was still a babe in christ but you have that like man i'll die for god i'll do whatever and as soon as the you know you you're at the you're ready to batter up you know it's so intense it was so intense for me and i failed him i failed him hard well, I was. It's so hard because we have to deal with that flesh. We are completely at enmity to with God, and that's why He's such a good God. He's He's not mad at us when we fail or, you know, when we betray Him. It it breaks His heart, but it breaks His heart because He knows that we're infected and that we're sick, and that He wants to make us better. And so, I, I don't know. I think that God permitted that whole situation to happen. I think that's a big part to review our experience um, and, and talk to God about it. I don't know. That's why I believe the Holy Spirit put upon my heart to share is that we really should pray to God about that whole situation and to learn from it and ask the Holy Spirit on how we could have changed things and to help prepare us for what's to come. Because I believe that it's, it's going to be somewhat replicated, but in a more religious aspect with a lot more religious undertones. And so, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. No, it's good. No, I agree with you. I agree with you. And and I think that there's a there's a verse in in John uh, that says, you know, Jesus would not. Um, as, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna misquote this, but, but it's it's something to the effect of 
Jesus would would not put their confidence in them in, in man, you know, because he knows what is in man. Basically, what what he's saying is that he he knows that man is 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 not reliable. Um, so he would not he would not confide with with man he, because he knew what what is in, in in man. So he's not mad. He just he knows what what we are, and he knows that you know we're not reliable. Um, and then the reason why the story of Peter and him with his, you know, human confidence is there, you know, is again, is to point out the reality of, of our condition, you know, um, that as, as much as we want to, um, to be good and like, in our know, power, like, yeah, be true to Christ and all that. We, we, you know, our promises are like ropes of sand, you know, that, they don't last and and it's and the lord knows that so he already made provision for it but it's it's just um, interesting that you know anything that we have um uh faith anything you know really is based on the grace that god has already uh provided for us and i, I think that that's it's very humbling um to be honest you know because honestly we a lot of us we especially as men we want to think that we yeah, the Lord can rely on us because we we're men of our word type of thing, you know. But <laughs> the reality is that you know it's 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 nothing that is nothing to God, and and it is really is nothing. Um, but um, if we rely on Him and and His provision, that is what's really going to make the difference for us, and it's humbling even for us because then you know we have to say that, that oh, you know. It's nothing in me really that you know if i'm saved is it's not because of me um if i'm saved it is because of something you know a, a great work from a, from a loving god that that made it happen one last thing that i want to say is just going into this holiday season um just what we always have to do keep keep your eyes on jesus and um I think that the concept of peace on earth and goodwill to men, like Jesus is the glorification and the true example of peace. We see in humanity, our way, <laughs> we see the full, like at the cross, you see, you see human nature and what it does when it's next to some, the holy, peaceful, character of god god's character is love and peace and jesus is the complete epitome of that example and jesus brought peace to this earth we can see in him the way god deals with even cruelty murder lies all of the human pitfalls and um so i think sometimes people think like oh jesus came to the world now we all have peace no we have peace when we surrender to jesus and allow the character of god to be imparted in us through trusting the holy spirit and in that place when you allow the holy spirit into your mind and your heart that is where liberation happens that's where freedom happens because you god frees you from your sins like if i was still drinking and smoking and going out partying and doing that whole life but claimed jesus i would still be killing myself and and enslaved into all of my vices but i'm in a place to where i don't want any of those things anymore i've been freed from them i have peace i have joy i have something real i'm not you know i'm not chasing these shiny hollow objects and and filling the moments with with <laughs> i would just fantasy and crap you know so I just, I found such joy and peace in Jesus Christ. And I just pray for other people in the world to really come and study him because only in him can we find healing. It's the same thing that happened when he walked the earth is the same thing that's happening today while he lives in heaven. Yeah, I, I always understood that passage as in Luke chapter two, by the way, where the angels show up to the, to the shepherds. And say, you know, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, 
goodwill to men was meant like peace peace on earth was mean, meant peace between God and humanity. I never thought that that meant uh, peace within here, you know, within us, you know, because clearly, you know, the shepherds and the um, and the and and the the religious establishment, you know, at the time with the Romans and all this, you know, that you could tell that it's not going to peace wasn't going to happen because you know Jesus was born, and then it didn't happen because of it. But is is the peace that you know God brings is that reconciliation between heaven and earth in the in the person of, of Jesus. Um, that which brings me to the other part of that piece, which is you know now keeps ringing into my head, is how we how can we make peace with one another? I think that part is more um, on our part rather than his. It's it's like now that we have peace with God, can we make peace with one another? Um, can we make go ahead and make peace with those and that's a that's a tough one for me. Uh, I, I mean it's, it's I've struggled with this for years and it's now you know, like this theme keeps coming back again, you know, and what better time than you know than this time of the year uh to begin to make peace in that in that sense. Yeah, having again, like don't make peace for the sake of making peace. You know, make peace because you understand that you have peace with God now. You understand where you what where where you stand with God. Now can we make peace with one another? Yeah. And I think that part is is more um more of, of the will is up to us. Um, basically, you know, because God will not force anyone to um, uh, to get along with with whoever who, who who doesn't want it. It has to come from the heart, but the heart has to understand that, you know, if God is able to make peace with us, you know, who are we not to make peace with one another? And I think that's that's the thought that you know we should be thinking of. So I think for the challenge for this for this. Um, for this season, at least for myself, would be to to try and be more proactive in uh, trying to make peace on this earth. Um, now understanding that, you know, all my sins are forgiven, and in, and in Christ I have peace with God. Now it's my my turn to make peace with with others, as well. Yeah, beautifully said. And I think when that choice is made. There's healing on the other end and, um, and the liberation. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, guys, what a beautiful discussion. And I'm excited for this uh, month of December where we can really uh, show the love of God in Christ Jesus. And... It's a real privilege and honor to be able to do this with you guys. Keith, is it okay if you uh, end us with prayer? Yeah, I can I can finish us with prayer. Yeah. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for your goodness, for your love, for your kindness. On um, this um, time of the year, when we begin to think about um, your birth, Lord, uh, may may it not escape our our minds to be able to um, reconcile with those whom we whom we come in contact with. Above all, Lord, we want to be those who claim to be your followers um, to use this opportunity to show your love to those whom we come in contact with. Not that we have it in us. Um, within our power to do it but as we surrender to your Holy Spirit that through you you may be able to show love to those who we come in contact with so whether we find somebody who asks for our help somebody with, that we notice that we, we need our help and we volunteer for, to them whether we come in contact with a co-worker or a friend or even a stranger um in every single interaction, 
may we be more cognizant. <coughs> Sorry, may we be more cognizant, cognizant about uh, showing your love and doing what we can, or, or being vessels um, of help of your grace. Lord, I, we ask that you forgive us for our sins, cleanse us from all righteousness, give us a new heart and a right spirit, and help us, Lord, to live according to your Holy Spirit. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.